morning comes from Genesis verse, or chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my lords, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said. Get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set those before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself, to herself as she thought, Am I worn out and my Lord is old? Will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I didn't laugh, but he said, Yes, you did laugh. Holy wisdom, holy word. All right, for today's passage, we are back in Genesis with what's a fairly straightforward passage, right, about hospitality. These three men, three strangers, show up at Abraham's house. He sees them on the road. He jumps up and says, oh, great, like I can offer hospitality. I can welcome you guys. I can give you some rest in a culture that's very distinct and different than ours, right? Welcoming the stranger, sort of how close houses would have been found, how long somebody might have been on the road before they found a place where they could stay and rest. If you've been in the Middle East, Egypt, it depends on where you are in particular, but you might be on long, dry, desolate <laughs> roads for a while before you come across somebody. We can sort of imagine those particulars. This story also has this part of the call of Sarah and Abraham. Earlier we heard, you know, that God told Abraham or Abram at that point in the story that they're uh, their offspring would number into like um, the grains of sand, right? Be as many as the grains of sand. That didn't happen in the ways that they anticipated. So we re revisit that with Sarah and, oh yeah, that, you know, she's going to have babies. And she's like, I'm an old lady. <laughs> that, that ain't happening. Um, we're not dealing with that part of the story today. Just know that I'm shelving it. You're like, why didn't you do that? It was intentional because we're focusing on hospitality and what it means to offer hospitality. And we created this series, um, I created this series in conjunction with the other United Methodist pastors in our area. So Kashmir Monitor uh, up in Chelan, across the river at Trinity, and up in Leavenworth, Matt Gorman. So we worked together, brainstormed together, studied the scriptures together. And what stood out for each of us was that as we heard this story, we heard this abundance and extravagance in Abraham's generosity and, and his hospitality, right? He goes and he gets lots of flour, takes it to Sarah, makes some bread, and he goes and he finds a calf and he finds a servant, slaughters the calf, gives it to a servant, the servant prepares the meat. Meat takes a lot of work, especially if you don't just go into Safeway and buy it at the butcher counter. Um, 
it's a whole process. Sometimes, depending on the meat, it's, it's days, sometimes even weeks, right? Just letting it cure and get right and those kind of things. But Abraham takes the time and then he's got milk and he's got curds. He has all this abundance to offer these guests. And at a point in the story, they're just strangers, and I'll admit that when I was listening to it, I heard him say, Lord, if you'll do this. And I thought, oh, no, Abraham recognized that it was God, God showing up. But that, that was a misunderstanding because later Sarah says, Lord, but she's talking to Abraham. We don't have a good equivalent that I know in English, but in Spanish, the word Señor serves multiple formats. I can use Señor as uh, a proper honorific, right? Senor Sperry is my husband, right? Mr. Sperry, right? So Senor Kimmel, right? Senor Gore. Uh, Mr. is how it works. You can also sort of use it in the place of sir. I can just say Senor and it means sir. But Senor with a capital that's not at the beginning of the sentence is Lord, like God. So in Spanish, it serves both. And in the Hebrew, we sort of get that double meaning. Um, so we've got Lord, but it's really just generic for these men. So Abraham receives these strangers, offers abundant, extravagant hospitality. And we talked all about that hospitality as a group um, of pastors and what it means. And my mind went immediately to the hospitality that I raised with, I was raised with. And I think we all do this, right? Like, I give you a word and you go to what your lived experience of that word is. So for me, hospitality was not this. This was for the family. <laughs> this was dressed down. This was basic. This was every day. More often than not, it was actually at the kitchen counter, not even at the dining room table. I told you, I think last week, having guests and company over meant pulling all of the excess mail or the this or the that that was set on the table. Um, we threw it into a Xerox box and put it in somebody's bedroom and closed the door. That's how we did hospitality in my house. And, um, and then we brought out the good stuff, right? We use the everyday at our house. But when we had company, then we got the good stuff, which the good stuff was, or at least included, the good linens. The linens that you had to wash every time you used them on the table because guaranteed somebody was spilling something. You couldn't just like hide it in the dark colors, right? You used the white, which meant you had to wash the white. And then I told first service, I have a remnant of that. I don't use it much. Um, but I have this nice antique white linen tablecloth that I think was like my great grandmother's that has to be starched and ironed before you use it. So I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> Thing is, is, I believe in transparency and I don't wanna leave you with any kind of illusions about what kind of human I am in my everyday life. Uh, <laughs> I can put on a good show with anybody, but really, in my humanity, I'm a realist and a pragmatist, so I don't use things that have to be iron. But I love those of you who do. Don't, it's not dismissive in that kind of sense at all. And then we would use the good dishes. For us, they're antique china. We've got my grandmother's set, my great-grandmother's set, I think a great aunt set. My mother has at least three sets that she inherited. And um, they sit in the buffet most of the year, but, but for special occasions, Christmas and Easter, we would get them out. And I was raised white upper middle class, which for us meant when you set the table, the forks were on the left, the knife and spoon were on the right. There are very particular rules about these things in case you didn't know. The salad fork goes on the outside, the dinner fork goes next to it. If by chance you have another one like crab or something ridiculous, it's a little one that goes on the far left. Your dessert one would go at the top. The knife protects the spoon from the fork. So it sits on, I'm serious, this is the rule. 
the knife faces the direction of the fork to protect the spoon. It sits on the other side of the plate. You might have the salad plate in the middle there, or you might have your bowl. And there's a particular ordering for the water glass and the wine glass. Um, we have the crystal goblets that you wash by hand. When we did good meals, you use the sterling silver that you could only wash by hand. You don't put it in the dishwasher or you will be polishing silver for the rest of the holiday weekend. Uh, that's the house I grew up in. And we had the candle holders, often sterling, but not only. We had crystal ones and we had wood ones and you put the tapers in and it was always a special treat to be the one who lit the candles and even more special to be the one that could blow them out. And, you know, we had flowers and all the things. And so I started imagining sort of the visual preparations of what generous hospitality is, good hospitality is. And then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, had a little come to Jesus with me and said, Debbie, get real. <laughs> or at least be more honest about all the things. The first is, I don't do the white linen ironed tablecloth. I have not accepted any of the offers to inherit the china at this point because it primarily means I have to find a cupboard to store the china so that I can use it twice a year. Um, I love it. I don't want it to go away. My dad's still alive, so he can keep it in his cupboards for now. Uh, but I, I don't do all of that. I, I don't want all of that work. And so then I started thinking, well, what about the food? And we have this feast prepared for you um, that takes hours of work, hours to do tamales. You have to prep the meat and you prep the salsas and then you prep the masa and then you put the things together. You have to prep the corn husk first and then you have to steam each batch of tamales for an hour. It takes a lot of time. We had 15 people making you your food for today. And that doesn't count the people at the store who made the rice and the beans for you. And, and I like to do that kind of thing. I love Love to cook. For me, it's very cathartic. It's healing. It's a gift of love. Um, and then I thought, well, but how would my friends who hate to cook feel if I said that that was the best hospitality? Because some of us hate to cook. You can admit it. Open forum in here. You do not like to cook. And that is not a sin. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. It is not a sin to not like to cook. Particularly for the ladies, we need to hear that, right? Because we are taught that that's part of our job in life. And for those of us that don't like it, then there's sometimes this less than kind of thing. Do you just set that off and you go set it on fire tomorrow? Um, because it is not a sin to not to want to cook. It is not a sin to the grocery store and to pick up the side salads or the meat that's rotisserie or the fried chicken. It's not a sin to order takeout. It's not a sin to pick up pizza and go to the park so that you don't even have to think about any of these kind of things. Because some of us don't want to clean up before you get there and some of us don't want to clean up after you're there. And some of us don't want to deal with any of that. And we can still offer hospitality. There is still a gift of hospitality in its many forms. And some of us love to go to the nines and to take out the good linens and the good dishes and all of that and to spend days in the kitchen. That's a good gift. And some of us want to meet at the park and just hang out. And you know what? That's a good gift. There are many ways for us to do hospitality, and I want us to understand that. I want us to embrace that, and I want us to claim that sometimes we can be judgmental when we bring in what we have from our childhood, and we go, oh, we got the paper plates. Because for us growing up, that meant that, that there wasn't much effort put in. But that's not true in every household. Sometimes that just is. Those are the plates we use and that's what makes it functional or the dishwasher's broken and I'm not even washing all those dishes by hand. And so we just do what works. And it is still a good gift. Because you have the connection. The connection is the relationship. The, rela the, the connection is I did this for you. To whatever measure, in whatever form or fashion, I did this for you. And some of you are doers like me. There's, there's a contingent in my family, most of us actually. We, um, we're on the cleanup clue, crew. We consistently do the dishes, but we were also raised, because this was part of good hospitality, that you don't let somebody's empty plate sit in front of them. 
So either you force them to eat more food and dish it up like grandma did, or you clear their plate right away. Well, then once you're in the kitchen, you might as well rinse it. And if you're rinsing it, you might as well load it. And so there's a whole cohort of us that just sort of traips off to the kitchen after we serve a meal. And confessionally, I have to make a very consistent effort to just sit. Even if it's great conversation with people that I love, there is this thing in me that says, get up and clean up. It doesn't matter whether it's your house or mine, because if it's your house, it's not a fence. It's just me doing my part to say thank you by helping you not have such a big burden at the end of the event. But sometimes you just want your guests to just sit. You just want them to visit. That's why we went through all that work was so people could come to our house and relax. And here's the other side of the story. That hospitality isn't just about what we provide or what we give. It is also about what we receive. It is in receiving somebody's good gift that hospitality sort of lives as a full gift. It's showing respect and appreciation when I can eat the food that you made or sit at the table that you dressed or hang out with the people that you invited. That's part of how we sort of embrace the hospitality that's offered and I know I normally teach more of the particulars of the passage, but for me, hospitality is such a lived thing. It's not just about what we talk about in the Bible, but we all have experience of the hospitality, right? Hospitality that has stood out for different reasons, just because we felt comfortable as soon as we walked in the door, sometimes because we were served, sometimes because we know somebody spent hours making this thing, or because we know they really tried and it all went to pot right? The the chicken still frozen in the middle or the pie got burned or something sideways, you know, and you just smile and suck it up and you participate the best you can because you know that part of hospitality is in the receiving. It's saying thank you in word and in deed. And so as I thought more about hospitality, I thought, I I don't know that I can capture it with just one story, so I have 15, but I'm going to feed you at the end of it. I don't really have 15. It's okay to laugh. Um, But I have a few. Few where the giving and the receiving were profound in my mind. One is simple, and uh, it's from when we were in Cuba in 2004. We, the, Cuba was still under Castro. Some of the restrictions were lightening, but it was still a very communist country. Uh, the rations were $5, five pounds of rice, two pounds of beans, a pound of sugar per individual a month. That was it. 2004. Um, I've shared this uh, in light of another story, but that was the ration. And so when you know, especially coming from North America, U.S., uh, that that's the ration, and somebody puts on a spread for you, what you see is sacrifice. How much they saved, how much they put together, how much they sacrificed so that you would have this abundance. And it was true where we were served in the churches, but it was also true in restaurants. And there's more money in restaurants because of tourism, but still under the same communist regime. And so we were served uh, a black bean soup. I was sitting with a good friend of mine from seminary, and uh, I've traveled more than she has, and she tends to be a little bit OCD, and I say that with lots of love. Uh, She's very particular about lots of things. And she looked at her soup, and she said, Debbie, there's a dog hair in it. What do I do? Because everything in her said, no. And she would have just not eaten, right? Or asked for somebody something different or sent it back to the kitchen. And in the U.S., that would have been customary, normative, even expected. Um, but there, in the developing world, where folks only get $5 a month and five pounds of rice and two pounds of beans and a pound of sugar, I said, you take out the hair, you eat it, and you smile about it. And she was like, okay. And she did, in the giving and the receiving, right? An acknowledgement of what was and what is. And a and, uh, follow-up conversation after first service. I know that there are certain locations where you got to be extra cautious. 
There are places in the world where I've traveled where we didn't eat any fresh fruits and vegetables because the water wasn't potable, and I did not want to live with Montezuma's revenge for any period of my travels. Uh, when we were in uh, Honduras, and we were in a rural town, more than two hours on a dirt road, no electricity, they'd only had running water in 2005 for 10 years since the last team put it in the gravity-based, no indoor plumbing, just turn on water that you could run um, and fill a bucket. We couldn't drink that water, our team couldn't, so we boiled all the water. That was a sacrifice of wood and time and resources. Our hosts did that for us so that we could participate. Um, and no refrigeration because no electricity. We slept on the floor of the church, had no pews, had no chairs. We brought our bedrolls and our sleeping bags with the intention that we would donate them. Most of the team knew, bring, bring something that you can donate. Um, and so that was sort of the circumstance. We provided a medical clinic. We worked on the team. We did interviews through the week. We brought like a solar powered singular setup for grinding corn, which was their primary industry. And they were a partner with Heifer International. So they had been, I think, for about 15 years. Over the years, they had grown their um, flock of chickens and they had grown their herd of cattle. It's about 10 or 12. About 200 people in this community and they only sacrificed a cow, butchered a cow, every two to three years, depending on what was available. So this is a high, um, high level commodity. We were about 20, 25 on our team, and on the night of celebration, they served us beef. It was a tremendous sacrifice, and there's no refrigeration <laughs> I don't know how many of you have raised or butchered cattle, but there's kind of a lot of meat involved. Um, and it's a waste, not want, not society. So you have to figure out what to do with all the parts and the organs and the skin and the bones and the, all the things, right? We didn't participate in all of that side, but we were given this tremendous gift of beef. And one of our team members was vegetarian. She didn't eat meat, and she knew that after not eating meat for an extended period of time, if she ate meat, it would make her sick. And yet, what she wanted to do was receive well. So she had a small portion of that gift that was offered, and she gladly shared the rest with other team who could take it somewhat inconspicuously. It's in the giving and in the receiving. And it takes many forms. Sometimes it's a grilled cheese sandwich. Sometimes it's a pizza. Sometimes it's a spread of tamales and rice and beans so that we might feast. Hospitality is a gift in the church and it's a responsibility for us. An opportunity for us to welcome one another as well as folks who might be joining us new and part of being gracious in our hospitality is to receive well. To not be critical or judgmental, be to be self-aware enough that when we go, oh, it's a styrofoam plate, <laughs> that we go, oh, that's some of my stuff coming up. That's some of my expectations, my norms, my worldview, and I can set that aside and simply receive this gift well. My hope is that after the service that you will stay with us, that you will feast with us so that we can offer you our good gifts. And I pray that you also receive those gifts in the love and the intention that they are offered. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for all that you are and all that you do, for the example that you set for us and for the many saints and witnesses who have come before us from Sarah and Abraham down through the ages, Mary and Martha, countless others, millions of others, those who have spent time in the kitchen, those who have opened their homes, those who have opened their hearts, those who have invested in relationship with us. Help us to be good givers and help us to be good recipients, that through our shared time together, we would embody the gospel. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.